Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first joint grand rounds of 2021. It is uh, truly my honor to introduce Dr. Ed Benzel, Emeritus Chairman of Neurosurgery at the Cleveland Clinic and Director of Career Development at the Cleveland Clinic Neurological Institute. Dr. Benzel, as almost everyone here knows, has been a real guiding force in neurosurgery, transforming both spinal surgery and neurosurgical training over his decades of dedication to our field. He studied at Washington State University and the Medical College of Wisconsin, and he later joined the faculty at Louisiana State University after his residency, becoming the chief of neurosurgery only two years later. He then went on to become the chief of neurosurgery at the University of Mexico, where he started both the neurosurgery training and spine fellowship program prior to joining as vice chair, then chair of neurosurgery and director of spinal surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. He recently stepped into the role of emeritus chairman of neurosurgery in 2017, and he continues to shape resident education at the clinic. Dr. Benzel has helped to found the Lumbar Spine Research Society in 2007, in addition to serving as chair of numerous societies and national committees, he has an incredible portfolio of peer reviewed publications, authoring nearly 10 textbooks and over 425 book chapters in addition to that. He became the editor in chief of World Neurosurgery in 2015. His CV is actually so long that it, it can't be sent over standard email. Uh, his academic accomplishments, however, have really been complemented by his dedication to patient care and physician communication and he is integral to physician development nationally. Beyond these innumerable accomplishments, however, what he's really best known for is his leadership and his role in education. His transformative leadership has surpassed the three institutions that he has led as chair and has both a national and global reach. His educational innovations have won numerous accolades and he's been honored at many national spine and neurosurgery meetings including most recently with the named Spine Surgery Symposium at the WNS in 2019. On a personal note, he is the reason that I trained at the Cleveland Clinic, and he continues to be my gold standard for what a mentor and leader should be. Dr. Benzel, we are thrilled to have you join today. Well, thank you very much, Rupa, that uh, you are way too kind, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I, I am going to cover a lot of ground here uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. I'm, um, I'm gonna focus on leadership and doing what's right, et cetera, but I'm gonna take a little bit of a spine slant to it. Some of you may have seen bits and pieces of this, but one of my favorite sayings is repetition is good. So sometimes it's good to re-digest things that you have digested previously. Um, I only have one disclosure and I'm involved with a company that makes a intelligent mouth guard for trauma um, detection. Um, and it has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the talk I'm giving. I have three objectives today. One is to recognize the importance of leadership principles and skills. The second is to discuss the principles associated with the development and maintenance of a rewarding career as a spine surgeon or a neurosurgeon in academic and or community practice. And to appreciate the overarching importance of doing what's right and how such is fundamental to the establishment of a foundation for career satisfaction. So we're pretty good. This is a, a football analogy. Um, of uh, drawing up a game plan to craft a, 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 an operation that does what we want it to do. But I'm not so sure, that's the how. I'm not so sure how good we are at the what's and why's. Should we be doing that operation? We should ask ourselves, for example. And is it the right operation? Um, a rewarding career relates to work-life balance, having good partners, and by the way, from what I gathered in my talks with folks today, it seems like y'all got good partners and interact exceptionally well with each other. And I, 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 at least from my vantage point, I'm very impressed. It, it, it involves fulfillment, hours, case mix, institutional fit, leaders versus boss. And I'm gonna talk about this in a bit, adequate resources. But hinging on all of this is doing what's right. Uh, and appreciating uh, uh, ha having a sense of fulfillment 
about doing the right thing. So my first objective was recognize the importance of leadership principles and skills. Leaders are selfless. I don't know how many of you have read the book, When Breath Becomes Air. It is a, a gripping book by Paul Kalanithi, who was dying of uh, cancer. He was a resident uh, finishing his training at Stanford at the time. And I was particularly captured by one of his uh, quotes or his, his lines in, in the book, where he was talking about the medical students at Stanford who wanted to get the words uh, selflessness, essentially, out of their mission statement. And so he, his comments following that were several students argued for the removal of the language insisting we place our patient's interests above our own. The rest of us didn't allow this discussion to continue for long. The words stayed. This kind of egotism struck me as antithetical to medicine and it should be noted entirely reasonable. Indeed, this is how 99% of people select their jobs, pay, work, environment, hours. But that's the point. Putting lifestyle first is how you find a job, not a calling. We are in a calling. At least we should perceive ourselves as such. But leaders are also selfish. They need to get out of the hospital. They need to spend time with family and they need to create this work-life balance thing we talk about. Leaders are passionate about what they do. Leaders are egalitarian. They never play favorites. They treat every person as if they do, did, and they do put their pants on one leg at a time. This is my definition of leadership. The art of causing others to deliberately create a result that otherwise would not have happened. I will show this several times here this afternoon uh, because I think it's worth uh, rethinking and thinking uh, 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 over and over. Everyone in this room or on this uh, session are leaders. Um, this is my grandson, Jake, he's 10. He has two little sisters and he leads them to better places every day. He is a leader, just like us. Leadership, um, the qualities of a good leader are social awareness, vision, self-direction, ability to motivate, and self-awareness. Social awareness has to do with uh, being empathic, communicating effectively. Vision has to do with goals, self-direction, ability to motivate patients, for example, and self-awareness. The top and the bottom one are critical to leaders to understand how am I coming across? Um, what are other people thinking about what I'm saying? And am I, am I truly being empathic uh, when I communicate? Teddy Roosevelt said, uh, people ask the difference between a leader and a boss. The leader leads and the boss drives. I came across this cartoon and I said to myself, this is a perfect uh, dis visual description of Teddy Roosevelt's uh, comment on leadership. The boss is telling people what to do and the leader is in line, toting the barge with everybody who follows him or her. So in order to have a rewarding career, um, and we can think of it as at the twilight of a career like I'm in or the beginning of the career like the residents, we need to think about work-life balance, good partners, fulfillment. Um, think about who you're working with and working for. Um, are they leaders or are they bosses? And doing what's right. Leaders lead. <clears throat> On the left is Violette Racinos. She's one of my partners, a pediatric neurosurgeon and a wonderful person. Um, she is talking to a patient here, a little girl, um, and she's interacting with her and examining her and having a great time with her. But what she is really doing is leading. She is causing this young girl to do something she might not otherwise would have done. That is cooperate. So we play a game, Violette gets her examination and everybody wins in this situation. If you look up leadership, 
there are innumerable different classifications of leadership. All of these, but the last two are regarding reward and punishment. Um, the boss is rewarding and punishing rather than leading. Thought leaders are what we'd all like to think of ourselves as individuals or firms that recognize that are recognized as an authority in a specialized field whose expertise is sought and often rewarded. We all would like to be regarded as a thought leader. But the servant leader uh, serves the people he or she leads, which implies that the employees are an end, end in themselves rather than the means to our organizational purpose or bottom line. The art of causing others to deliberately create a result that otherwise would not have happened. Boss versus leader. Leaders often want a title, but not the work. Make no mistake, being a leader at every level requires a lot of work and requires people to work hard. Leaders are competent. I would like to dissect a bit this word, competence. Um, the, when we were medical students or interns, um, we were unconsciously incompetent but we didn't really know how incompetent we were. Um, we um, then, as we go into our early years of residency, uh, become consciously incompetent. And we see, holy cow, how much, there's so much I don't know. It's a very frightening and suffocating and potentially um, very difficult time. Then as we meander through the residency, we become consciously competent. We learn how to do operations. We learn how to do them well. Um, we make diagnoses, we read, we add, add on to our knowledge base. And then we become towards maybe our chief year, unconsciously competent. We don't even think about it. We just react, we do the right thing it, uh, nearly all the time. So unconscious competence it relates to habits. We've developed a lot of habits, but guess what? There are two kinds of habits, good habits and bad habits. And so we must always reflect and, and be reflect and have a reflective, uh, be, uh, employ reflective competence. Leaders perpetually reflect. Um, I, you probably, most, most of you have probably heard the term heuristic, which is basically a rule of thumb. I'm gonna use two examples here um, that I feel are important in us assessing ourselves as leaders and uh, assessing ourselves uh, objectively as to how the good we're doing. So before you conclude that a treatment was effective, look for other explanations. That's one heuristic. And the other I'd like to discuss is if you see evidence of success, look for evidence of failure. So let's go to the first one. Before you conclude that, conclude that a treatment was effective, look for other explanations. Well, this person has a large extruded disc fragment and you could operate on this patient and uh, take a lot of credit and pound your chest that you really did this patient a great service. The trouble is this patient didn't have surgery and the symptoms resolved all by themselves. So how often are we taking credit for a good result that may have been caused by another event or natural history? If you see evidence of success, look for evidence of failure. And look at this, this uh, post-op x-ray. And I know that this uh, uh, middle-aged lady had significant improvement in myelopathy. And so if you look at just that, um, she had a great outcome. Unfortunately, if you compare her post-op x-rays with her pre-op x-rays, we left her with a straightened spine. Um, and 
she has a significant amount of neck pain that I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I've left her with for the rest of her life. I, we could do an operation to correct the deformity, but she doesn't want that and she's, she's living with it. So this statistically, I guess, was a good operation, but from a very fundamental level was not. So I asked the rhetorical question to you, how many of you in the audience here have ever come to work with the intent of pissing somebody off? Um, I'm guessing no one, but I'm also guessing if you're human that everybody here, including me, has done that occasionally. Um, we all care, that's why we don't intend on doing that, we care. But sometimes um, we ineffectively express the fact that we care. So expressing the fact that we care is basically empathy. To always try to understand the other individual um, and think twice before lashing out. And we say, like, we need to be leaders. We need to have all these characteristics, again, particularly social, and self-awareness. Leaders inspire. This is Sanford Larson. May he rest in peace. He was my chairman um, in neurosurgery and he was really at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He was a pioneer neurosurgery spine surgeon. He, um, he was a lousy teacher, lecturer, excuse me. Um, but he created an enriched environment in which we learned. And although he didn't say this, this is not his quote, it could easily be, I cannot teach you anything. The most I can hope is that I cause you to learn. We are all leaders. We lead our patients to take their medications, do exercises, diet. We work with colleagues, friends, and family to build something together, to solve problems, to respect each other, trust each other, develop loyalty and mutual respect. So my second of three objectives is <clears throat> related to wisdom. Discuss the principles associated with the development and maintenance of a rewarding career as a spine surgeon or neurosurgeon in, the academic, in academic or private practice. Leaders are wise. Albert Einstein, who was deeply concerned about the harm that could come from what he did, as well as the good that could come from what he accomplished, stated, the most important human endeavor is the striving for morality in our actions. Our inner balance and even our existence depend on it. Only morality in our actions can give beauty and dignity to life. To make this a living force and bring it to clear consciousness is perhaps the foremost task of education. And I would like to change one word here because we educate through communication. We need to strive to communicate effectively. So this is the how. Um, what, are the, what about the what's and the whys. William Osler, in his uh, treatise, The Student Life in 1905, stated, begin to make a threefold category, clear cases, doubtful cases, and mistakes, and learn to play the game fair. No self-deception, no shrinking from the truth. Clear cases, doubtful cases, and mistakes. We must learn from our doubt doubtful cases and mistakes, no deception, self-deception, no shrinking from the truth. Leaders perpetually reflect. I, this case is burned into my heart. I think about this on how I could have been more effective. Dan Rue comes up with the bivector bi technique, which I've employed, and, but, and, and other strategies to make sure you get enough lordosis. But the real the real task at hand here is to not settle for what I settled for during the procedure. Harvey Cushing kept track of everything he did with photographs, drawings, uh, commentaries. And so he was always reflecting and he could reflect back at what he'd already recorded. 
I only show this because for the last 20 years since I entered the digital age, I've kept track of every operation that I have done. This is a database um, and I can find patients uh, to study if I need to or whatever. But more importantly, I can go back and look at my successes and go back and look at my failures. The what's and the why's. About 15 years ago, I was at a North American Spine Society meeting and a person who I just uh, about a year ago became aware of who, who it was. I couldn't remember who was giving the talk and I gave, I talked about this meeting and that person was sitting in the audience. He's Eugene Carey Dergy from, from Stanford, an orthopedic spine surgeon and a wonderful guy. Um, but he gave a talk <clears throat> and asked uh, the audience with an audience response system, how many people would uh, recommend surgery uh, for this patient with uh, back pain and uh, 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 some spinal instability of some sort. And 80% um, of the audience said they would recommend surgery. Then a bit later, he came back and asked the question, would you have this surgery? And 20% said yes. This is damning to our profession. Um, there is a huge disconnect in this audience when we would do things to others that we wouldn't have done to ourselves. Is that wisdom? Nietzsche said the most common lie is that which one lies to himself. Lying to others is a relative exception. I would like to define clinical wisdom as the ability to effectively assimilate data, observations, and prior experiences for the purpose of optimizing clinical decision-making by using a patient-centric approach. I'm sure that somebody in the audience can read this. Um, I most certainly can't, but I understand that literally translated, this is from 20 BC, Leviticus 19:18 in ancient Hebrew. Um, and it is the first recording that I know of, of the, some semblance of the golden rule in Western cultures. Um, do unto others as you would have done unto you. This is Rich Schlenke's, he doesn't really have red eyes, um, but it sort of makes his uh, shiny head show off a little bit. He gave me these slides. This is knowledge converting to experience. Knowledge is the dots, the experience, involves the connecting of the dots. Knowledge, experience, using a patient-centric approach. These overlapping rings uh, are reflective of um, a couple of things. Number one, uh, let's think of the ring on the left, the blue one, uh, as being wisdom, okay? Uh, in, in a way, this wolf is wise. He's, he's, uh, he's cunning. He survives in a hostile environment uh, because of his wisdom. Um, and so he sits over there. He can't do um, um, you know, differential equations, but he functions very effectively in his environment. On the other side of this, we could say there's this surgeon who does a lot of unnecessary surgery, making a lot of money, not necessarily doing a lot of good. Um, and um, not very wise because his dot falls completely outside of this uh, blue or black circle. This is a risk that we are that we take, um, and that is relying too much on the almighty dollar. You don't want to be that guy or gal on the right. You want to be in the middle and try to uh, walk that tightrope. Um, <coughs> That involves character, moral excellence, and firmness, a person of sound character. Now I'd like to talk about the literature because the literature is what we base what we do on. This is how we should really establish the what's and the why's. But Mark Twain said, and he's correct, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. In 2016, um, Cassaret wrote an interesting article in the New England Journal of Medicine on the illusion of control in which he talked about therapeutic illusion and confirmation bias and how we kind of prove what we want to prove with our research, et cetera. 
Uh, so therapeutic illusions lead to confirmation bias. And I'd like to discuss very briefly conclusion-based research, um, which is hypothesis-driven research and process-based research, was, which is essentially exploratory inquiry. Conclusion-based research uses frequentist probability. Pro uh, process-based research using, uses Bayesian probability. Con Conclusion-based research uses these strategies to try to prove a point. Process-based research tries to determine the truth. There is a significant and increasing volume of research that looks at the validity of prior research. Why most published research findings are false the truth wears off. Is there something wrong with scientific methodology? And most of you have probably seen Scott's parabola, um, how an idea looks promising. Some early studies by biased individuals show that it is promising. More people use it with a huge amount of enthusiasm. And then people start trying to replicate what happened on this side of the curve and can't do it and find that there's more and more complications as we go along the curve and finally leads to extinction of the technology. This is, this, we've seen this over and over and over in medical and surgical uh, treatment strategies, et cetera. The problem here is that there are fortunes lost and gained, but more important than that, in the wake of this parabolic curve are many patients who have maybe perhaps been hurt and hurt badly. Again, I keep remembering this patient. So we need to function together. We are all in this together. We need to function as a team. We need support. We need to, with that support, create enriched environments. These are just some of the people with whom I work, who I consider colleagues, friends, part of the team. These are my sons, they're part of my team. Um, these are their wives. Um, one couldn't be there for this one event, but uh, so I took a picture of her on the beach. Um, but we're all part of a team and so are the grandchildren and the children. Um, I show this picture because I think we need to not forget what appears to be the little things, but which are huge things. The, fulfilling things. My daughter-in-law was watching a podcast that I was doing and my granddaughter recognized that it was me and kissed the screen. Um, uh, I can't tell you how much that meant to me and it's all part of the team. This is Mary. She's my spousal unit, my wife. She has been a pillar for four, over four decades. Um, my recommendation to all, all of you, if you have a spousal unit that is a good one, work very hard at keeping him or her. And if you don't have one, find one. Okay, finally, I want to appreciate the overarching importance of doing what's right and how such is fundamental to the establishment of the foundation for career satisfaction. True leaders do what's right. This is Robert Young. He played the role of Marcus Welby on a TV show in the 60s and 70s. And he was this primary care doctor who took care of uh, people and all, always did what's right. So here he is dealing with a pyramid, taking care of many, many people and, and uh, selflessly. But what's happened in the last several decades is that this pyramid has been turned upside down. We see so many people sitting at the bottom with their hands out, trying to catch the money that filters from <laughs> all these patients. So in the era of Marcus Welby, we dealt, we had value-based care. We, we uh, were reimbursed essentially for the good we did. But then volume-based care turned over and a concern for the almighty dollar. And we're trying to get back over here to value-based care, but between there, these two plateaus 
is a huge chasm. That's where we are at today in North America in trying to come to grips with the healthcare crisis in a sense. We're trying to get over to the other side without falling off. Market pressures keep us over here. Doing what's right causes us to wanna to be over here. So you could look at this volume basis versus value-based care as two canoes. We have our foot straddled in each of the two canoes. At some point, they're gonna diverge we have to declare ourselves the good we do versus how much we do. In the good old days, doctors often did not know or ask or care what they were paid for individual services. Rather, their concern was simply that in the aggregate, they made a reasonable living. Insurers never influenced the patterns or types of care simply served they simply served as financiers and redistributors of the funds dedicated for healthcare provision. Industry was not involved in the provision of services such as reimbursement support like it is today because it did not affect the usage of their product. Hospitals would tolerate losing money on one service because they gained it on another. Then doctors, insurers, and industry began to increasingly focus on reimbursement. The emergence of an emphasis on volume based medicine. So practice managers emerged, reimbursement specialists, device and pharmaceutical manufacturer advocates, consultants, specialty hospitals, political advocates, and PACs, uh, yes, and administrators. I hope there are no administrators on this session, but we can see here in the 1970s, uh, there were very few uh, administrators um, and, the, um, and the number of administrators, relatively speaking, has increased nearly exponentially while the number of physicians has not. Um, we're being run over by the administrators in a way, but it is it all their fault. That old model was never built to withstand such an onslaught of self-interest from multiple sources. So if we go from 60 to 2009, we see the healthcare expenditure compared to the gross domestic product has increased from 5% to now we're really approaching 20%. This isn't all the administrator's fault. Our per capita healthcare spending is high in the United States. It's actually about $7,000 per person per year and if you multiply that times 300 million, that comes out to roughly 200 or to two trillion dollars, which is how much we spend on healthcare. But let's compare us with Norway, the second most costly country in in the world regarding healthcare per capita, and we're two thousand dollars more per person in expenditure for healthcare than Norway. Our infant mortality is higher than most other first world and most certainly uh, uh, low, low and middle income countries. Um, our quality of life is not at the top, it's somewhere down in the middle. If we look at quality of life in, we come out at about 31. Look at all these countries that are ahead of us in quality of life. Now, of course, uh, we are the most powerful nation, um, but we do not enjoy the greatest quality of life and just look at the countries who, who are. Are we getting our money's worth? Evidently not. Uh, I have an interesting quote from a Frank Smith who is a Canadian orthopedic surgeon. I don't know this man, but I was enamored by his quote. It has always been a source of bewilderment that the richest and most powerful nation in the world should have a healthcare system that while providing state-of-the-art services to those who can afford it, and thus most likely to not need it, either leaves the less fortunate denied or rendered destitute by the cost of care. Now, this is a bit harsh, but I think we all get his point. Again, we have this increasing expenditure on healthcare in this volume-based care environment. And again, we spend much more than other first world countries. 
But Tua Gawande um, addresses this subject on a number of platforms, but he basically is a strong um, advocate, if you will, of the notion that we uh, uh, significantly overtreat, we overimage, which leads to unnecessary procedures and on and on and on. And um, we need to come to grips with this. We know that through the Dartmouth data that there are regions of the country where there is a tenfold increase in spine surgery rates. Um, and you can't tell me that there's a tenfold difference um, in, per capita uh, in indications for surgery between the low and the high rate for surgery states. Um, this is almost certainly due to the characteristics of the surgeons. I had just moved to the Cleveland Clinic from New Mexico in 1999. In 2003, um, these two ladies, Reed Abelson and Melody Peterson, were writing an article on an operation to ease back pain that bolsters the bottom line too. And they wanted to interview me because they knew I felt we did too much spine surgery. And so I said, holy cow, I could get into a lot of trouble here. I talked to the media people and they told me that I need to have three sound bites. They taught me how to be a politician. These three sound, they said, have three sound, three sound bites and no matter what they ask you, you only respond with one of these answers. And so they were, physicians cave into market pressures that less than 50% of operations or fusion are indicated in my opinion and that the system for physician reimbursement is totally perverted. I think we all agree that it still probably is. I think we all agree that we cave into market pressures. But in the 10 years following this, the per capita rate of spine surgery for pain doubled. So if it was twice as much, if I was correct and we do twice as much spine surgery as we, we should have been doing in 2003, perhaps in 2013, we were doing four times as much. I'm gonna close by focusing on an avenue that I think we can pursue. Uh, and that's the chronic pain patient. But the chronic pain patient is sort of like the elephant in the room for us blindfolded physicians who can't see the chronic pain syndrome. Um, we examine and say, well, this is a, um, you know, different parts and that people have different thoughts about what we are actually seeing in the room. So chronic pain syndromes are multiple. We're not the only ones who deal with this for sure. TMG, TMJ pain, headache, pelvic pain, GI pain, the GI docs uh, deal with a horrendous problem of chronic pain patients. Joint pain, fibromyalgia, and of course, back pain. But all these patients from a psychosocial perspective are the same patient. They just have a different wrapping. They present, that wrapping causes them to be presented as TMJ, pelvic pain, GI pain, or back pain, for example. We spend roughly a third of our healthcare dollars, as has been estimated, on, on chronic pain. That's $635 billion, which is a, roughly a third of the $2 trillion annual expenditure for medical care. If we could cut that roughly in half, um, $300 billion is roughly 15% of 2 trillion or the amount of dollars we spend on healthcare across the country. Um, we could reduce the amount of healthcare dollars spent significantly on healthcare and necessarily we could get us back to where we were in the early 90s with regard to the healthcare percentage of growth domestic product. We just seem to, we need to get a grip on identifying patients. Value equals quality over cost. And if utilization rate does not correspond to value, we're heading in the wrong direction. So if I was a non-physician um, healthcare politician, um, I would look at what we do like lumbar fusions, et cetera, and say, your data isn't so good. Uh, we're gonna deny payment on that. 
Do we want that? We know that fusions work. We just may be using them excessively or in the wrong, the wrong patients. <clears throat> so thinking through this, I would like to discuss four types of back pain. <clears throat> Myofascial pain, inflammatory pain, like associated with ankylosing spondylitis, mechanical pain, which is a pain we could effectively treat with surgery, <clears throat> and chronic pain syndrome. Myofascial pain affects all ages. It is the most common type of pain. It is episodic. It is acute onset, usually associated with muscle tenderness, <clears throat> improves with time and exercise, and is very common. Inflammatory pain um, occurs in young adults, usually males, uh, is worse in early in the morning, gradual onset, improves with exercise, improves with exercise, <clears throat> does not improve with rest, uh, it is nocturnal, and it can be associated with other factors such as alternating buttocks pain, et cetera. <clears throat> Imaging findings can show um, sclerosis of the SI joint, laboratory tests can show um, uh, abnormalities as well. And then there's mechanical back pain, deep in ag and it's a syndrome. We often group back pain patients into one glop. And in reality, they are uh, very different, these four different types of pain I'm describing. Mechanical pain is deep and agonizing in nature, which is worsened with loading and improved with unloading. Most importantly, it's improved with unloading. Patients can seek and find a position of relative comfort. So we have all these different syndromes and I would like to introduce to you a term that I think I made up, but I don't know, there's never used, never an original thought and that's pseudo concordance. And I define that as an apparent but erroneous relationship between an assumed cause, i.e. an imaging study and an effect, i.e. back pain. Let's take a patient with, with inflammatory back pain who has all these findings, but the surgeon sees him and says, oh, you have a spondylolisthesis. Now keep in mind, that's an imaging finding. It's not a diagnosis. And so the surgeon ignores the pseudoconcordant symptoms that this patient has. He's really describing ankylosing spondylitis symptoms and he ends up getting a fusion. Now, the whole thing is switched. He's got metal in his back. Nobody is ever going to look like look at him like he's got ankylosing spondylitis until he's looking at his belly button. And the error was in establishing the correct diagnosis, inflammatory pain. They didn't see the elephant in the room. Now let's look at chronic pain syndrome. They have pain that's been around for a long time. They have non-restorative sleep, low energy level, decreased activity, 24 seven pain. And they could come in with back pain, but their diagnosis is a chronic pain syndrome. We're not gonna make them any better because we haven't defined a mechanical back pain syndrome. We just see a finding which is incredibly common uh, even in asymptomatic people. So Satchel Paige, a famous uh, American baseball player who's one of the first players to break the color barrier, played for years with the Kansas City Monarchs and actually took a hit to come to Cleveland to play baseball in the major leagues at age estimated to be about 45. He was an incredible athlete, but also witty and sort of a comedian. And he, is, he actually stole this from Mark Twain, but he popularized this statement. It's not what you know, don't know that hurts you. It's what you know that just ain't so. So let's shake all our preconceived notions and look for patients who want to get better and try to help coach them instead of standing in line, um, wanting to be enabled with toxic pills and surgery. We need to get patients that are willing to and we need to help them get there, work on lifestyle changes. So when assessing patients for surgery, Stop, think, the elephants are everywhere. Don't be guilty of operating on a pseudo-concordant finding. Operate on the clinical findings and then see if the imaging matches your clinical notions. 
Ask, is there an elephant in the room? Think clinical, not imaging first, not the other way around. So I have this little algorithm that or five questions that I ask patients. Do you have low energy? Do you get restful sleep? Is the pain there 24 seven? Do you spend more than 12 hours a day resting and or sleeping? Are you suffering and do you have multiple complaints? If they answer three to five of these as true, the odds are great that they have a chronic pain syndrome and any operation you do may be doomed to failure. So seek active versus passive strategy. Surgery is passive. The patient just lays there and says, doctor, heal me. Pills are passive. Losing weight, core strengthening, flexibility exercise, cessation of smoking uh, are all critical and they're active therapies. And if patients are willing to do that, you have won half the battle. Empower them to do that. If you have cognitive behavioral therapists um, and pain psychologists, use them. What they will do is talk to the patient about hurt versus harm. It's gonna hurt you, but it ain't gonna harm you. Do more, not less, keep pushing yourself. Sometimes main membrane stabilizers help and wean from opiates and don't forget opiate induced hyperalgesia is very real and opiates in the long run uh, with non-terminal pain. Um, uh, make the pain syndrome worse. First, do no harm. So identify the patient. Um, it's not the diagnosis. L45 spondy isn't the diagnosis. The diagnosis is chronic back pain or mechanical back pain or inflammatory back pain. So my final recommendations to you are appreciate the overarching importance, importance of doing what's right and how, and how such is fundamental to the establishment of a foundation uh, for career satisfaction. Look at what we do as a passion, not a business. Look at what we do as striving to provide increased value, not increased volume. Think about how much you do versus the good you do and get the blindfolds off and look for the elephants in the room. And I, I, although I spoke about spine surgery, there's elephants in all of our rooms, brain tumor surgeons, uh, skull base surgeons, vascular surgeons, et cetera. And please be both selfless and selfish. Keep that work-life balance uh, in balance and be empathic and think of your work as a calling, not as a job. So I hope I've met these three objectives for my talk today. Um, these are some of the excerpts from my talk. Um, and what I advice I have for everybody, including myself, is one word, lead. Um, and when you do, when you help a patient get to a better place, whether that be dealing with their terminal disease or doing a great operation or just being there, being there when they need you, when you walk out the door <clears throat> at night and you're on your way home, you will feel like clicking your heels. Yes, you will say this was a good day. So I thank you. And in closing, um, I would like to share uh, a quote from uh, Machiavelli, which pertains today probably as much as any time in history since Machiavelli. <clears throat> there is nothing more difficult to plan, more doubtful of success, nor more dangerous to manage than a creation of new orders, the, the creation of a new order of things. We must be bold, we must lead, we must create a new order of things. And again, I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Benzel, for those in incredible pearls uh, and for, for your wisdom. Um, you know, it seems like in the, in the essence of this, we have this immense responsibility to train residents and each other um, really in the, the social responsibility and the, the ethics of what we do. Um, and it seems like all of that, the art of the diagnosis and the art of avoiding the pseudo concordance, a lot of that starts in the clinic. So how, how are in this environment, how do we balance the time that our residents really need to spend learning 
uh, the, what they learn in clinic compared to the limitations that we have and the pressures of spending time in the operating room. I, I think we struggled with it, you know, at the clinic, it seems like we struggle with it everywhere. Well, yeah, you know, I don't have an answer for you. You know, we, we struggle with that. We need to have, you know, repetition is good. So the more surgeries people do, the better off they are from a technical perspective. Um, but that's the how, okay? We don't spend a lot of time on the what's and the why's. We, the resident may see the patient for the first time in the operating room and never see the patient again after the operating room. They don't really know whether the operation was indicated or not. Um, and that's a problem. I think personally that, um, and er, let me say this, every faculty thinks they're the best teacher. Okay, I, I can guarantee you that. Um, but some objective person needs to find a few faculty, in my opinion, that <laughs> residents spend time with and, and, and gather pearls, useful information. And I think we need to focus more on the quality of the outpatient experience as well. And we probably don't need as much surgery experience as we think we do, but... Um, you know, I, I, I don't have an answer for that, but I think quality of outpatient experience is really important. Hey, uh, Ed, it's Roger Hartle. Yes. I, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation and I even, mo even more, I enjoyed talking to you in private before, uh, but I, I had a question regarding the um, interdisciplinary or uh, multidisciplinary care that you do so so well at the uh, Center for Spine Health at Cleveland Clinic that you've been, you know, that you started and, and that's been very successful over the years. And you talked, you talked about pain syndromes, you talked about cognitive behavioral therapy, pain psychologists. And I was just wondering, how do you, how do you successfully, and that's really a big question, but uh, how do you successfully integrate a pain psychologist into, for example, a spine health center where you have surgeons, orthopedic, neurosurgeons, where everything is so focused on really doing something that's mechanical, because th th that's the challenge that we're facing in our spine, in our Center for Comprehensive Spine Care, that is very difficult to really integrate non-operative care, or especially psychology and cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, I'm getting a page here. Let me just ignore this for a second. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, um, so I apologize. Yeah, we we have a, a a small army of clinical psychologists, social workers, uh, 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 physicians um, who come come from a pain management or or psychiatry background, but who focus on chronic pain um, and APPs. Um, and so we can refer patients to them and the patients can be of several types. Can you help us? Does this patient have a chance of getting better with surgery? If they do need surgery, uh, can you help improve the outcome um, uh, from a, a chronic pain perspective? Because a patient could legitimately need surgery and have a chronic pain syndrome as well. And you can do a great operation, but they very, very well may not get any better. For example, patients that are on long-term narcotics prior to surgery are virtually 100% on chronic narcotics a year after surgery. Um, and so there needs to be, I think, a strategic plan made with each individual patient. One of the things that we fell into um, uh, with uh, the COVID thing is that most of their work can be done um, virtually. And um, that means that um, they can, with, they, with, they don't have to see people in person. So I'd, I'd be seeing somebody from Michigan four hours away and I want them to see a chronic pain provider. Well, they'd either have to wait till the next day maybe or not see them at all in, in the near future or come back to see them. Well, that's not gonna happen. But now they can make uh, virtual appointments and uh, effectively manage these problems uh, uh, virtually. So um, th that's how we're doing it. We have a, they're not part, a true part of our um, Center for Spine Health. We have a, a, a chronic pain center. So we're sister 
departments, if you will. And, and we work together in, in a collaborative manner. Thank you so much, that was great. Ed, uh, I have a question. Uh, that was an amazing talk, first of all, and it was uh, just um, so um, spot on for the kind of leader you've been uh, all of your career. But what I wanted to ask you was, do you think that leaders like you were born that way or did you learn along the way how to be so wise um, because uh, most of the leaders that we run into are, are, as you say, bosses and not leaders. And, uh, and I wonder if our society trains people to be bosses rather than leaders. I think you're absolutely correct. Um, so let me just share if I can do this in a quick manner. Um, I have been preaching for more than two decades that we need, just ask a couple of questions, you know? How do you sleep? How well do you sleep? Uh, are you fatigued? Uh, does your pain bother you 24 seven? You know, we can't really effectively treat most pain syndromes that are there 24 um, seven. And, and why don't we ask these questions? Um, uh, because I have gotten 20 years since I really started, you know, carrying this flag, um, I've gotten nowhere. Literally, I mean, um, many people just don't want to know or don't ask the questions. They just, it's not important. We're, we may get there through the back door. And that back door is machine learning, big data, uh, artificial intelligence. Because someday, maybe in the near future, uh, we can replace logic and um, things that some people, I guess, like you said, are born with and others that are not uh, with a machine that says, no, 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 let's not operate on this patient. Um, you know, and it, it, and it may tell us that we can't operate on the patient because that we won't get reimbursed for it. Um, and that probably can happen, but that's really disheartening to me that all we needed to do was have an interest in it, but it, it didn't happen. And so I'll take it. If the machine learning can help us, uh, I'll, I'll take it. Did I answer your question, Dan? Well, no, actually I was asking about uh, whether you're, you were born that way or did somebody teach you how to be such a great leader? Because um, you know, the, people always ask, are leaders born that way or is it what they learned um, during their life that gives them the wisdom to uh, be able to be such good leaders. Okay, you're, you're putting me on the spot. See, I tried to be a politician, like I talked about <laughs> earlier, and, and ask, answer a question that you didn't ask. Yeah. And I'm glad that you had the courage of saying, no, no, you really didn't answer my question. <laughs> um, honestly, I have been involved for about 10 years in our, the Cleveland Clinic uh, program on empathy teaching so all of our all of our residents all of our fellows all of our staff go through patient communication courses and i've been involved with this um and i think i've learned a lot personally i had a lot of growth by being involved with with that program mm -hmm. however i think i came that way mm -hmm. so i i think i was born with it Sorry. Um, I think that I, uh, I thought I turned my alarm off and I didn't. So that is an alarm set at six o'clock to remind me to take my medicine. I've, I've come into a new uh, series of problems. I had AFib, had an ablation. And I says, well, great, when can I come off this, uh, um, um, effect, uh, what do you call it? Um, Eloquist? Eloquist. And, and, and the doc says, Eloquist. The doc says, never, okay? So this is a new era of pain medication taking for me. It's not just taking a pill once a day and it doesn't really matter when you take it. I have to take it 12 hours apart. And that has been challenging. But I do think getting back to your, your question, I do think that uh, I, I marched to a different drummer. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I think it's not always good, but I think most of the time, the vast majority of the time it is good. Now, did that answer your question? Yes, and how, So my question to you is, if it is a good thing, how do we get people to also march to that drummer? Well, I think uh, having people like you give talks like this is certainly a, uh, a great way to do it. Honoring people who have been like you at major societies and putting you up there as an example of how we all should behave, I think is a very good way of doing it. I mean, anybody who's known you uh, and knows you um, uh, knows what kind of a person you are and uh, you're, you're known by your reputation. And, uh, and uh, so the fact that uh, you know, people like you have been highly successful show that nice guys don't finish last. And, uh, uh, and, and I think that's the way it is. A lot of bosses aren't like that. I mean, you, you, I've trained with a lot of people who basically, you know, uh, ruled by executive fiat and fear and uh, mm -hmm. had a bigger stick than a carrot and they drove you. And you, Roger you and I were talking more. about that earlier today. Uh, you can't get away with a lot of those things today that you that people could years ago yeah uh, which is a good thing we're yeah. kinder and gentler we're, we're maybe we're getting there you know maybe yeah. well thanks that was amazing <laughs> well thank you so thank thank you so much again i think that you know there are probably endless questions that we can try to ask to draw the wisdom out of you um but We've been working you all day. So <laughs> thank you to everyone for joining and for the residents on. Uh, Dr. Benzel has been kind enough to lend another 45 minutes of his time to meet with you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So we'll, we'll uh, give him a little bit of a break here and then we can- So meet. do I just stay on this link here? Yeah, you can stay on. So go ahead and take a break and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll be on here. Okay. okay, sounds good. Thanks so much. And so I'll, I'll just, I'll stay on here, but I got to answer a page and thank you all for uh, having me and uh, putting up with me for this last hour. <laughs> thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh,